So in rotational spectroscopy, especially for diatomics, we have only two rotations around Rx and Ry. And they're the same moments of inertia too. So we only really have one rotational constant in a linear molecule. In a, uh, in a nonlinear molecule, we have three rotations and, uh, and, and things can get a little bit more complicated. Okay, so we now have a new quantum number. We've been using N for the particle in a box. Uh, for vibrations, we used V for the vibrational quantum number. So you can sort of keep a running list in your notes for your quantum numbers. You know, for the uh, particle in a box, it was N. For vibrations, it was V. Um, and in the notes and in, in literature too, it's kind of difficult to tell between V and the Greek character nu, which is the vibrational frequency. So just put that in your mind to, to like uh, be careful with that. Context wise, it is, context is necessary for you to know which, if we're talking about the vibrational frequency or if we're talking about the vibrational quantum number, okay? Now for the rotational um, quantum number, it's J and here's your energy level equation. So this is the equation for the energy levels. And it's traditionally written as B times J times J plus one. Okay. It could have just as well been written as B times the quantity of J squared plus J, <laughs> right? You could distribute that through, but this is the traditional way of writing it. We'll stick with tradition. Uh, what is B? B is the rotational constant. And so this is a uh, sort of a generic equation for the rotational constant, Planck's constant over 8 pi squared, the speed of light, and I. And, you know, in um, in the particle in a box, uh, mass and, and the length of the box was down here in the denominator. Uh, but for rotational energy levels, it's the moment of inertia, which for a diatomic uh, would be the, the reduced mass and the bond length. And so we still end up with a mass and a length squared in diatomic rotation. So it looks exactly like our particle in a 1D box. Okay. So B is that rotational constant, I is the moment of inertia. And then this R uh, is the distance from the rotating axis. So in this case, we have eth uh, ethane here and it's rotating around the Z axis. And this is the uh, moment of inertia, it's the sum of all of those masses times their distances from the rotating axis. Since we're dealing with uh, um, uh, like a methyl group or whatever, it's got three identical masses for Ma. Down here, I think they have deuteriums, and so it's three identical masses uh, from, uh, you know, Md, uh, all for the same distance. And so uh, it can be simplified a little bit. But anyway, it's just to show you that you have different moments of inertia for the different types of rotation. This is water rotating around its C-axis. Notice it's not the bond length, the OH bond length. It is this length of the hydrogen from the rotating axis. If water were to rotate around this axis, where the center of mass is really close to the center of that oxygen, we would have this R here. So R um, of the hydrogen to the y-axis if it's rotating around this one. And we would even have this small rotation of, of oxygen moving a little bit, <clears throat> R for the oxygen, R for the hydrogen. <coughs> and so there's only three, three ways to rotate a molecule. So if there's a rotational axis coming out the front, which there is, this is the x-axis, then it would be them rotating around this axis. Uh, for a diatomic, we have this right here. This this is a kind of an interesting thing. We have this distance here, let's call it R1, and this distance here, we'll call it R2. And we have two masses, but we can take all of this, two masses and two bond lengths, and reduce it to the reduced mass mu is equal to m1 m2 over m1 plus m2 and then r is equal to r1 plus r2 <clears throat> so that's why we like the reduced mass it takes a two particle problem 
and turns it into a one particle problem as if we have a single rotating mass, the reduced mass rotating at a distance, the bond distance from the center of mass. Okay, so, so for diatomics, it becomes really easy. We just have one reduced mass and one bond length. So that's why we're gonna study the rotation of diatomics, <laughs> okay? You, you could expand this into the others and it just gets a little more complicated for that moment of inertia, but, but for diatomics, it's really easy. So if we can get the rotational constant for diatomics, then this piece down here is just mu r squared, okay? And that's the, that's the moment of inertia for a diatomic. Now, one thing that I'm pointing out here with these little red arrows that to have a pure rotational uh, spectrum, remember for, uh, for spectroscopy to occur, we needed to have three things. So for review, you may want to write these down. So the three things we need for spectroscopy, okay? We need an unequal population and energy levels. So we need an unequal population of energy levels. We need a a particle that can interact with an oscillating electric field. So that could be a charged particle, or it can be a particle with a dipole moment or a change in dipole moment. So that's that's the interaction with the electric field because light's coming in with an electric field. And then we need light to come in to, to do that. So we need light, we need a particle that can interact with light, and we need to have uh, an unequal population and energy levels so that we can detect the signal. <clears throat> so for pure rotational spectroscopy, we need a permanent dipole moment. Nitrogen, since we have two identical atoms on either side of the molecule, when you spin nitrogen, there's no change in charge distribution. So nitrogen cannot absorb light in pure rotation because there's no handle for light to get a hold of. There's no positive side of the molecule or negative side of the molecule. But for carbon monoxide or HCl, we have different atoms on either end. That dipole can spin with the electric field coming in. Yes? Wasn't there R and then R. This right here, it's just, this is the bond link. So this whole thing is R. And it's the sum of R1 and R2. This little two is kind of on top of that black stick. So it's a little hard to see. But yeah, this is R2 right here. And this is R1. And so we've just reduced it to a single bond length and a single mass. So, so this is, a, so zooming out, let's think about the, the particle in a box, which we could think of as electronic wave, uh, wave functions or electronic energy levels. Um, they are super far apart. That's why we had to increase our temperatures for our particle in a box to 500,000 Kelvin to get excite, excite, uh, excited electrons in the upper states, in the visible region. Um, so in electronic energy levels, those energy levels are really far apart. The visible range is really energetic. And, and, and so the UV vis light interacts with electronic energy levels. But if you zoom in down at the ground state of the electronic energy levels, that's where you see the vibrational energy levels. So you see what I'm doing here? Well, I'm zooming in on that N equals one. And there's a bunch of vibrational levels down there at n equals one. And so this is where we get the vibrational levels. Okay, so V1, V2, you have zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, two, zero, and so on. You have all kinds of vibrational energy levels for a molecule. This is a particular molecule that just has two vibrational levels. Okay. And so, um, so that's, that's where the vibrational levels are. You see what I'm doing? It's like zoomed out. You have the electronic. You zoom in. You see the vibration. Well, if you zoom in on the vibrational levels, then you can get to the rotational levels. So it doesn't take much energy at all to rotate a molecule. You're not stretching a bond. You're not moving an electron away from a nucleus, which takes an enormous amount of energy. Opposites attract, right? And so we're pulling that electron away from a nucleus. That's why it's so much energy for the UV vis. For vibrations, we're stretching springs 
covalent bonds. And that's really hard to do that. Not as hard as pulling an electron away from a positive nucleus, but it's still pretty energetic. But rotating a molecule in space where there's no external fields, not very much mass at all, not very much energy at all, because you're just pushing masses around the center of mass. And so those are really close together. And those are your J levels. J equals one, two, three, and so on. Uh, notice the V quantum number starts at zero and the J quantum number starts at zero. So put that into your head too. N starts at one. Okay. <clears throat> So we're down here at rotational levels. And in fact, we have rotational levels on every vibrational level. So even, even up here, if we were to zoom in on this level here, we would also have rotational levels. So they're not just in the ground state, but I'm just trying to show you if you zoomed in on the ground state, you would see those rotational levels. Okay. And then the same up here. If you got up here in the excited electronic state and zoomed in, you would see the vibrational levels on there too. It would just be an excited electronic state and you could have the vibrations of the bonds that are, that are still there. And so this takes place in the microwave region of the spectrum. Really low energy light. Okay. So light must be able to interact with a rotating molecule, so the molecule must possess a dipole moment. All polar molecules possess a dipole moment. So if it's a nonpolar molecule like methane, you're not gonna see pure rotational spectra. But if you have a, a molecule like, a, um, like, uh, well, like water, yeah, it has a di permanent dipole moment, and so it will have a pure rotational spectrum. CO2 would not. Carbon monoxide would. So CO2 is a symmetric molecule, does not have a uh, permanent dipole moment and, and can't uh, absorb light in its pure rotational spectrum. Now the selection rules are plus or minus one in, in J. So if you're thinking about this um, quantized rotational motion, it, it's kind of weird. I mean, quantum mechanics is weird in general, right? we can think of the guitar string idea, and that makes sense. You have a particle in a box and it, it has to be a standing wave, right? So you can pluck the string and it can go like this, or you can have the, the n equals one, two, where there's a node in the middle, but it has to go to the zero at the end. Rotation is also quantized. Now that's a little strange because um, it's as if the molecule can rotate this fast or this fast, but nowhere in between. <laughs> That's bizarre to me, right? Because you'd think rotation would just happen at any energy at all, but it's quantized too, okay? And it's because of the rotational wave function. Just like a guitar string uh, has to be a standing wave, there's standing waves on rotation too. So this is a nice ring, it's homogeneous, or the same all the way around, and it has resonances. You hear the tone? That's what rotation is in a quantum mechanical way of thinking about it. So even though we talk about particles rotating around the ring, it's really the resonances of a ring. It's really the wave functions of a ring. Got it? So, so it, but it, conceptually, it's nice to think of, of the planets, right? Here comes Earth <laughs> going around the sun. And you could hit it with light and make it go faster. And you could give it one unit of angular momentum with every photon of light. And so that's why the delta J plus or minus one, light has one unit of angular momentum. And so it can hit that molecule and make it spin one unit faster. But it can't spin it two units faster if you just have one photon of light. It can't spin it three units faster or four units faster, okay? Um, it can slow it down too, so delta J minus one. So light, like the molecule can be rotating this way, but light could be circularly polarized in the opposite direction and cause it to go down. So that's a little strange, but that's what that can happen. Now we talk about selection rules in terms of angular momentum, <clears throat> and that's a great way to understand it, but I didn't really like that. I liked using symmetry for everything. Symmetry was real easy in the, in the uh, particle in a box way of thinking. 
And so I asked uh, my grad student to look into trying to figure out how we would uh, use symmetry to understand the selection rules for uh, rotational motion. <clears throat> and we looked through all the literature, we couldn't find that. And so, um, so we went through and, and put together the selection rules for, um, uh, for rotational motion based upon symmetry. Now, direct absorption, uh, angular momentum can be added to the spinning molecule or can be subtracted from the spinning molecule. But Raman transitions have two photons, or scattering transitions have two photons. And so delta J can be plus two, where both photons go with the molecule, or it could be minus two, where both photons oppose the molecule, or zero, where the momentum of light kind of cancels itself out. So you, if we think of light as possibly being circularly polarized, you could have a photon coming in circularly polarized in one direction and another photon coming out going the opposite direction. And the molecule doesn't have an, a net change in its angular momentum. These are the traditional ways of discussing the uh, selection rules. And then uh, Victoria was successful, and together we wrote this paper, in describing the symmetries of the wave functions um, in the selection rules using symmetry. Okay, so she wrote that up in her thesis and she graduated. Yay, so, all right, so, um, so this, uh, but let's look at these pictures. This, notice this ground state, that would be like the wave function just oscillating out, like the whole ring is breathing. And that's a vibrational mode I could find. If I had a high speed camera and I could suspend my ring in space somehow and get a, like a, a speaker to cause it to vibrate at a certain frequency, then we would see that breathing mode where it's just going out and there's no nodes. So that's what the solid circle is. If it's doing this, meaning it's expanding just in one direction, so it's squeezing this way and then it's squeezing that way, there's a node this way that it is not, it's not expanding or contracting. So that's a way to describe the vibration that has one node. If it's squeezing out this way and thinning this way, and then sometime later squeezing the other way, there's two spots on the ring that aren't changing. And so then that has two nodes, and that's what's shown by this checkerboard. And so we could assign Millikan notations and symmetry uh, elements to these, and we determine the selection rules for a particle on a ring. If you're interested in that, that's all written up in this paper, but also in the book chapters that I linked earlier uh, in the course. So let's get to the spectrum. What do you see here? This should uh, um, tie into what we just covered on exam two. And I emphasized in the little thing, we have the levels and the lines. So these are the spectral transitions, which are differences in energy levels. So we're gonna be focused on the transition equation. We have the energy levels and we see all of these differences. So this right here is a difference between two energy levels. So that's gonna show up down here as a particular peak in the spectrum. So these transition frequencies are separated by two times the rotational constant. So a given spectrum will give you lots of measurements of B, which is related to the mass of the particle and is related to the bond lengths of the particle, it's okay. So it's related to the structure of the molecule. Uh, so since you have so many measurements of the rotational constant, you have really good standard deviations. So this is a great way to determine the structure of small molecules. And for 100 years or so, that's what infrared and rotational microwave spectroscopy was used for, is to get the bond lengths and angles of all these tiny little molecules, water, CO2, carbon monoxide, um, uh, learning about double bonds and single bonds and all of that stuff. So the structures of small molecules uh, consumed you know, the science in this area for quite a while. And so it's really useful for bond lengths and angles, but there's a problem with the maximum of three rotational constants, which is really three equations, and, and no maximum number of bond angles and links, so the unknown. So even DNA only has three rotational constants. So you're not gonna get all the bond links and angles in DNA from only three rotational constants. But for water, you could. Like you have three rotational constants in water and you have two bond links and an angle in water. 
So you could totally determine the structure of water using rotational spectroscopy. Uh, now, when you get to uh, something like ethane, symmetry helps because you've got three identical bonds there. You've got three identical angles and so on. So you can say, well, I know this bond length should be the same as that one should be the same. So if I determine, you know, that this should be a little longer, all three have to be a long, little longer. And so you can reduce it down to figure out how to solve for the, this, the um, size and shape of, of even larger molecules if you have symmetric ones. So here's Rayleigh and Raman scattering. Rayleigh scattering isn't really helpful for anything with molecular structure because there's no change in the molecule. It's, it's really just a classical phenomenon of an oscillating electron cloud scattering light. But notice over here for, for Raman scattering, we can get vibrational information, but we can also get rotational information. So in this case, these are rotational energy levels, and this will be pure rotation Raman spectroscopy. Anti-Stokes spectroscopy is, is much more useful in rotational spectroscopy because these energy levels are so close together that we have thermal excitation. So we have molecules that are rotating here. They're in this excited state of rotation. And when they interact with light, they can donate some of that excited energy to light and have a blue shifted photon. And we would see the anti-Stokes peaks and we would get this rotational information. So here's the pure rotational Raman spectrum. Notice the, here's the Rayleigh line. So this is the incident light. Most of the time this is using a laser. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put incident laser, <laughs> okay. So it comes in, it scatters off the molecules and it's really bright because Rayleigh scattering is like, a, I don't know, maybe a million to a billion times more probable than the Raman effect. And so most of the light is scattered at Rayleigh scattering. But then if you zoom in on these wings, you see the Stokes lines on the red shifted side and the, and the uh, anti-Stokes lines on the blue shifted side. So you have higher wave number scattering. Those would be the anti-Stokes lines. So like if this is a green laser, these would be red shifted and these would be blue shifted. Notice up here, the energy levels tell us what's going on, but it's the differences in the energy levels that give us the spectral lines. So in Raman, light's interacting with the polarizability of the elect of the uh, molecule, which is a property of the electron cloud. So no dipole is needed. So Raman spectroscopy can use to get the bond lengths of things like nitrogen. So N2. N2 doesn't interact with light directly because it doesn't have a dipole moment, but Raman can oscillate that electron cloud and you could get the rotational constants for nitrogen or oxygen or, or chlorine or any of the diatomics, the homonuclear diatomics. And the scattering selection rules are plus or minus two. And so that's why you see these arrows going up by two, by two uh, levels. And so, like I said, this is the Rayleigh laser. The Stokes is the laser minus this equation. So these are the transition equations. So this is the equation for all of these transitions right here. So if I label the J value, this would be like a, a J equals zero going to J equals two. And this is J equals one going to three. This is J equals two going to four, three going to five and so on. So if I put in these J values right there, add three halves, multiply by four times the rotational constant and subtract that from the laser line, that tells me where these peaks are. So do you see how the transition equation, we'll just have everybody repeat this, the transition equation, transition equation. 
tells me where my peaks are on the horizontal axis of my spectrum. All right, the transition equation. That's a lot to say, but it's, it tells you where those peaks are on the horizontal axis of the spectrum. What tells me the intensities? That's the transition moment integrals. That's those really long integrals that we did in the calculus week. It took six pages of calculus to calculate the intensity, the y value, the vertical axis of my spectrum. Okay, we're done doing that because we this is way too complex to calculate by hand. So we use symmetry to determine whether it's zero or non-zero. So all of those transition dipole moments are the vertical axis of my spectrum, and if it's zero, it's not allowed. If it's non-zero, there will be a peak there. And then we have the anti-Stokes equation. So these are the um, transition equations for both the anti-Stokes and the Stokes. And notice the Rayleigh is just the laser line. There's no shift. So whatever laser is hitting the molecule, it's scattered off. And I know that's distracting. I'm leaving the door open because it's so cold in here. It's warmer in the hall. So <laughs> maybe it has an effect. We'll bring a fan maybe. And now this full range is kind of hard to see down here. I'll erase these things. The full range, it's kind of hard to do this spectroscopy because the full range of the pure rotational spectrum is less than 150 wave numbers next to the laser line. And so you've got to have a really expensive laser, $100,000 or better laser, because it has to be a really high resolution laser, a very narrow line. Most of our lasers have a 200 or so uh, wave number width. Like the little fiber optic laser I have up upstairs is a great laser, but it's pretty low quality. And so it's got a, a pretty wide line width. And so I would never see pure rotational spectra because the width of the laser would blot out all of these lines. So pure rotational spectroscopy um, can be expensive and it's not that useful. So next time we're gonna combine rotational and vibrational spectroscopy because they can happen at the same time. And then we're moving all of these rotational lines up into the vibrational spectrum where we're not interfered with by the laser. So this is, this is the reason we're going through rotational spectroscopy is not because it's so common, but because the thinking of rotational lines will now be added to the vibrational thinking. All right, so, so this lecture is sort of a, a stepping stone to Friday. So Fridays aren't optional. <laughs> Please share to be here on Friday to, to where we combine rotation and, and vibration. So these transition equations, I'm really just gonna show you where they come from. Remember, anytime we wanna take, make a transition equation, we take the energy levels. So this is the energy equation, which gives us the levels. And a transition is a difference. You see that? Transition is a difference between energy levels. So we just write in, if delta J is plus one, then we write the energy equation with a plus one, J plus one everywhere there's a J. So see this J right here? It is now J plus one. It's pretty simple, we're just substituting. And where this J is right here, we're adding a J plus one there too. And so that's why this is J plus two. Right, it's J plus one plus one. And then we subtract the original energy equation. So this is the transition equation, it's just not simplified. The rest is algebra. And so you just go through that, you multiply through, uh, you multiply the two J, you know, J plus one and J plus two. So we end up J squared plus three J plus two. And then you multiply this J through. Now we can collect our terms. Um, Actually, I multiplied the b's through, and now we subtract things like this, this minus bj squared and bj squared. Those are, those are done. We can subtract this bj from this, so we end up with a 2 here. And so it's 2b times j plus 1. Okay, pretty simple. And then remember that b, it, rotational constant, is this piece right here. So buried in there is the reduced mass and the bond length. So we have the direct absorption 
is separated by two times the rotational constant. The Raman experiment was separated by four times the rotational constant. So both of them give us the rotational constant, but there's a little difference in the spacing of the lines. And that's important. If, you've given, if you're given Raman data, you need to take the difference between those peaks and divide by four. If you're given uh, rotational like microwave data or vibrational data, that's a direct absorption, you take the difference between those transitions and divide by two and get the rotational constant. Um, so this is just the same thing for the plus two. So, um, so for the Stokes transition, it shows the, the transition equation gives you a 4B. Okay. And so that's it. We made it. Can't believe that. So I'll see you on Friday. It's a big day. <laughs>